Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Emily Moyer. Michael Wan is with me. This is episode number 19 of Project Kids and we've got a very special guest today by, by request from Michael Wan. Danny Katz is here to join us. She's going to, it's a Project Kids episode, but I'm sure we'll play the glass bead game. But anywho, I know that Danny and Sadie have been wanting to jump in and Michael has been requesting. And uh, these are two of my uh, closest friends both with a lot and their own unique energy. So I'm going to sit back and let the fireworks begin. Danny, Michael, how are you doing this morning? I am doing very well with the exception of this heat wave. You asked me before we started to record, you were like, is your hair wet from water or is it sweat? And at, at, when you asked me that question, when you asked me that question, I was like, oh, I think it's water. And then you're like, oh, you took a shower this morning. I was like, no, I didn't. This is actually sweat. I'm in the middle of a heat wave in a sauna box and I'm sweating. But despite all of that, despite all of that, I am tickled to be here today because we've got our guest, Danny. I have followed Danny uh, through you, Emily, and I've always enjoyed watching the banter between the two of you. And so now I'm excited to participate myself. Danny, welcome to the show. And it is a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored that I was requested and uh, I love your, the shows that you guys do so much. So I'm excited to be here. It's weird that you're Everyone I talk to is having a heat wave and we have had the rainiest, like coolest, most beautiful summer here. It's very, I just consider it a high blessing. And people talk about the weather engineering and I'm like, what's the upside of just giving us a lot of, like, what's, what's the downside? How does that serve them and work against us to be engineering our weather to just give us a lot of moisture? I don't really get it. So we started off with that similar thing at kind of, uh, so we had some early heat like back in May, right? And like, like we had like 10 or 10 days or two weeks of like high 90s weather. And then we went into like a pretty cool most of the summer, right? Like there was also a good bit of rain, like sometimes 10 days in a row. It might only rain for an hour a day or whatever, but it was pretty cool. But in the last couple of weeks, it's ramped up as far as heat. Yesterday was pretty mild. It's supposed to be hot today. Um, but my guess would be a couple of things. First of all, like, I don't think there's much weather engineering going on here unless they've bought themselves a better cloud making machine, because we just have these like glorious, like Super Mario Brothers looking puffy clouds, like, you know, back like it used to look when you were little and, you know, pick the animals in the sky. So unless they've improved their chemtrails or bought a better cloud making machine, I don't know if this is geoengineering. I don't know if we've moved fully into the video game. And so I just am looking at Super Mario Brothers and thinking that it's like Super Mario Brothers when it is Super Mario Brothers others. Um, so that, but I also would guess in terms of if there is weather engineering and you're getting water, you might be getting water that others are not getting. So if they're steering, right, because there's not really a big city, there's not a big enough city that they, if that, or a big enough, like there's, New Mexico is very different than all the uh, other Western states in some ways, right, in terms of like the combination of positives and negatives that they have and the, the, um, the population of the people and the way it's laid out in the cities and whatnot. So my guess would be that water that may be, be being steered away from other places is just being dropped there because it, it, you know, they don't have the same set of plans. That would be my, my, my best guess. Michael, any thoughts? Well, like what Danny said, like the, the, wet, the, the summer weather this year, and I like to pay a lot of attention to the weather for a variety of reasons. Like the most basic is because I like to be around nice weather. So I pay attention for that reason. But I only pay attention by looking outside. I don't like to look at, at, the, at any forecast. I don't buy into that. But that being said, this summer has for 80% out here in the East Coast has been spectacular. It's been very, very mild, balmy, like low humidity. But then we get these like pockets of incredibly intense, Hence, hot, humid weather, which I mean, I can't tell if well, I, I have a difficult time remembering past weather from past summers, but I remember it mostly being like always hot and humid. And so this is uh, and I think you even get used to that. But it's almost like the back and forth. of Oh, it's really nice out. And then it's like this is unbelievably hot and humid. And I have lost my my uh, uh, ability to to acclimate to that that hot and 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 humid weather. So that in itself, I think, is a little bit um, 
you know, it keeps you unsettled. But back to the question which you brought up about the, the weather engineering. So the first question I have, and I don't know if I, I don't have an answer to it, is like, where do you buy these weather making machines? Like, is this an Amazon purchase? Or is this like, do you go through the, like the, the government purchasing agency? That I don't know. So there's that being said. But in the, this is a question I have though, here's my second question, then I'll, I'll throw it back into the, to the field is like, so in the realm of weather modification and weather warfare, are there two sides? Like from what I get, like, you know, the, the weather warfare is a little bit more like I push here to affect there. Like, you know, there's, it's not like a direct sort of thing. You're like working with jet streams and you're working with like clouds and all that sort of stuff. If you have two parties, that are kind of like battling with one another. Uh, what happens then, like all of us in between, like, you know, someone like zaps and they harp, they harp one sort of place and then someone's like, oh, let me counterbalance that. Are we just in the middle of that? You know, I don't know. Those are the questions I have when I think about like weather modification as an actual sort of um, uh, uh, operation, which is really occurring. Mm -hmm. I, so I think that we buy the machines at DARPAdepot.com. What is that? Um, that's where you buy all of DARPA's like nifty oh, DARPA control DARPA. mechanism. Is that like Restaurant Depot, but instead, or, or right, there's a place. It's a membership it. thing. It's, it's so, a membership thing. So is Restaurant thing, exactly. Depot. Right? <laughs> You need you need a chip. You need one of those like the 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 digital tattoos they were talking about in two six in twenty sixteen. That's how you get in. That's how you get in. Pretty much it's like Costco. So these these weather. Go ahead, Danny. I was just gonna say I like what you're saying about. I'm thinking of like referral pain in the body, like the pains in your shoulder, but it's really coming from your hip. Right, like, right, yeah, right, right. That's how I was envisioning it. The one thing that I will say is none of our lightning looks like normal lightning. It all seems exaggerated and over the top and cartoonish. But then I'm like, I was kind of prepping for them to set us on fire the way they did to Santa Cruz because the couple of people I know who live there said it was preceded by all this bizarro lightning, but it hasn't happened. So I just keep sticking with like, it's a miracle or the beings that live inside the mesas are protecting us or the aliens are doing something. Um, so hold, hold your thought on the lightning, right? Because Michael, without us even telling him, walked right into our, our hive here, you know, with his starting off with the weather. What did right? I walk into? Well, <laughs> Danny and I had a late night interaction last night that, that was kind of perfect based on other things I had been sort of focused on throughout the day. So we will let you in in just a moment, you know, we'll, we'll sort of clue you into what's going on there. But I just wanted to respond to your weather making machines. Like, so the way that I see it, so when we were driving cross country, I can't remember if it was when we were moving here, I think it was when we were moving here, right? There uh, was this bizarre chemtrail that we saw. Well, I've had two experiences with this, but one was much more clear, right? One time when I was driving to Phoenix, like I saw like things that looked like clouds coming off down low and then floating up, up into the sky as opposed to being the way we think it happens. And then when we were driving here, when we moved last spring, there was this enormous chemtrail that like kind of like arced across the sky and we were able to sort of see where it was emanating from and it wasn't the sky, it was from the ground, right? And if we had been willing to go off-roading, we probably would have been able to chase down exactly where it was coming from. Now, I had recalled hearing, I think when I like heard Alana Freeland talk about something one time about that there are these stations that do generate things from the ground, but I'd never seen one that was kind of quite like this. And these seem, the, the places that generate them seem to be out in the middle of the desert, not in any kind of like urban area or anything like that, right? So there's that. But also if you think about like, so one of the reasons I've always liked like parties and raves is they're like a small, like a, it's like going to Disneyland or Disney World. It's like a microcosm of the macrocosm, right? And in there they have like, you know, dry ice machines or like fog making machines. And it's long been my suspicion that, that sometimes they've got something else in them and they're gassing the crowd and seeing what happens when they add a little of this, a little of that. And so we're just like in a larger version of that. So my guess would be, like Party City or Guitar Center or something like that might be a place to get one of these cloud-making machines and you just need a bigger one. 
that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a, I can't argue with that logic. I mean, that's basically where, I, uh, where I'm going to go with that. Uh, I do want to say this, so I forgot to mention this. I have noticed this summer. I've, I have seen more rainbows this summer than I can recall um, uh, in the recent past. So I don't know what, what that is. And, um, and I heard an interesting idea yesterday. So there, there are two young girls who, who live in the house, which I live in. And uh, at, they're at the age where they're just like, the ideas are coming like left and right. And I'm gonna be quite honest, like a lot of them, like, you know, I'm not gonna put into practice. I'm like, you're nine years old. You really don't really know what you're talking about. But they came up with one yesterday and I was like, motherfucker, that's a good one. That's a really good one. <laughs> and normally, normally like, um, you know, I carry a phone because uh, I don't want to, but I carry a phone. And everything on the phone, like I try not to use, even if it's like helpful, just because I don't want to like further any type of dependence upon, you know, that, that device. But what they said was like, what if there was an app? Like most people have those weather apps, but if they had a rainbow app, which would like read all of the sort of like atmospheric core, uh, 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 things that are necessary for a rainbow and your GPS and the position of the sun, and they'll tell you where to find rainbows. And I thought that was a pretty good idea because I do like to find rainbows. I love that idea. And Michael, you just danced <laughs> further into my rabbit hole that I'm going to that I'm going to take you guys down today without having known it. <laughs> All right. Well, let's like, in, rather than just kind of going through our normal like weekend reporting stories or or whatever, let's just let's get into this sort of weather thing. Uh, Danny shared this with me last night. And so I'm going to share it with you while you share. So this morning while I was prepping, I was listening to the new David Martin that he put out yesterday and he was talking about lightning. I, you're stealing my thunder. <laughs> 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 this, is, this, this is, you know, we, we tend to do this. All right. So here is what Danny sent me last night. Let's see if I can make this big. Can you guys see this? Yeah. I can't really pretend that this is lightning because it's not raining and there's no thunder. Or whatever it is, isn't lighting up the way lightning lights up. Clouds are interesting too. The clouds. This happened. This was happening all night. By the time I went to bed, and it was still happening. Where are you? Where are you out of, Danny? I'm like seven miles outside of Santa Fe. Outside of Santa Fe. Okay. Yeah, and that's and what I, we're looking at in this video. Yeah. This is. And I reached out a friend who happened to be in Las Vegas. I'm not Nevada, New Mexico, and she was seeing it too. Like everything else going on on the planet. So from your, uh, like, walk me through, um, walk me through, like, why this was, I, I'm having a difficult time, like, really seeing the images, and probably because my screen is so filthy. Um, so walk me through what was so interesting, like, why did that capture your attention? Like, walk me through all the, the good things, because I don't think that the video probably captures, like, what you were seeing with your eyes and experience. Are you insulting my cinematography? Because I feel No, like I'm I not. I'm insulting <laughs> my dirty screen. Um, there were these flashes of light, but that didn't look like lightning. I mean, 
New Mexico summers are infamous for their gorgeous lightning storms. This wasn't that. These were these like diffuse bursts in the exact same spot huh. um, all night. And there was nothing lightning-like. We did not have any rain last night. There was nothing in the air. There was no thunder. And it was just this constant sort of diffused explosions of light. Very bright, very, very bright. And what were you saying your friend from, uh, from Las Vegas said? She was seeing it too. And she, I mean, I think in New Mexico, we always just assume it's UFO, it's UFO. Like there's so much of that. Um, but it was also so regular. Like if I see something that I'm deciding is a UFO, it's pretty momentary. You know, it doesn't like linger for, that was a couple hours of this light show. I looked online, no mention of it whatsoever. So your friend, your friend in Las Vegas, what you guys, so you, what, Las Vegas is to the West of where you are, correct? Yes. So the, so you were filming West. Is that, is that a correct? I was filming West. Yes. And your friend in Las Vegas was looking East and you guys are seeing the same phenomenon. Yes. So, wow. so when Danny sent that, what was interesting about it is we had the same thing last week, right? So Michael, remember I told you last Sunday that I had taken a nap and that there was thunder and a huge rainstorm, like enormous rainstorm. And I yes. marveled about how the thunder seemed to be coming from underground as opposed to from the sky. Like I thought maybe there was a bomb in the basement of the building or something like that, right? It sounded like that. It didn't sound like thunder roaring from the sky, right? And it was like, did something just blow up in the basement? And I'm gonna continue with my nap, I don't care, <laughs> right? But it went a couple of times and then the, then the rainstorm came, but it was odd the way I'd never felt thunder that felt like it was coming from underneath me before. Um, and then just a few days later, we had the same lightning st storm that didn't, did not have any rain or any thunder along with it. It went on for hours and it was like flashes. It was kind of like, it was like a, like a electric circuit was shorting in a large building or something like that on the ground and lighting up the whole, whole area. And it was pretty much coming from the same area every time. Right. And it wasn't really the sky. And I went looking up to see if anybody else was having this. And I was able to find like one video from like a year before where somebody was commenting on the phenomenon. Right. Um, and it was coming from the West for us as well. It was also coming from the West here. So, um, so we had that. And then in a completely different conversation at Conspiracy Cocktail this week, one of the girls was saying that um, she's been looking into this plasma that is coming from under the ground. These fires are really like plasma bursting from under the ground. And when you see some of these trees that are like, have fires that just like haul it out the middle, right? Like this is actually coming from inside the earth, right? And it's light, it's lighting up from the ground. It's not lightning from the sky, but just like, you know, other things, like think about how many times we've been told when we're watching like uh, videos or information about whatever happened in New York City on 9-11, that like, if you stop listening to what they're telling you, you're looking at and just look with your, turn the volume down and just watch what you see, you see something different than what they're telling. We have been so programmed to think lightning comes from the sky and lightning maybe does, right? But lights can come from other places, electrical charge, plasma, all these other things can come from other places. And if you look at like, um, if you go on the the Thunderbolts channel on YouTube, and they do a lot of stuff about the electric universe. There's one of their guys, I think his name is Andrew Hall. He, all of his stuff is about these plasma dragons underground, right? Like, and that's what created a lot of what we know is certain types of mountain ranges and certain ge geographic phenomena that we have, and that it's something that occurs in cycles, right? Like it's not something that's happening all the time. There's uh, like earthly cycles that bring about more of that kind of stuff. And it leaves almost like a scar, right? Like if you were to cut yourself with a, with a hot, you know, something hot, like or a laser or whatever, like it leaves this sort of plasma vein scar kind of thing. A scar like the Grand Canyon type scar? He, like he was more, refer he, like he had a, uh, like a set of mountains in like Utah that were like a perfect example of it in terms of like the pattern it generated. I think we've even maybe looked at it on this show before, Michael, or maybe in one of the groups or something like that. 
Um, but you know that it, this is a phenomenon coming from under the ground, not a phenomenon coming from the sky, right? Um, and so when I saw your thing, I'm like, oh my God, that's exactly what we were watching here. And if you ever look at like what it really looked more like than, um, than lightning was if you've ever watched like a video of like a, um, like a, a plant or a factory of some kind that has like a short or some kind of explosion in it and the way it like lights up the sky sort of from the ground up, it looked much closer to that than it did to anything we see coming from the sky, mm -hmm. right? So like we had it too and um, other people are experiencing some of this kind of stuff in some places I think it is leading to what they're calling fires, right? And maybe we can get into the narratives or the stories around said fires in these events in just a second, but like, just let you guys kind of respond to what I've just talked about there before we move on. I just want to toss in because it was hard to see the perspective, but they, these light explosions were very low. Lightning hmm. traditionally is way higher than hmm. what I was seeing last night. So that lines up. Um. Yeah, I've been watch. I watch yeah, for years. Like I think all people like we're naturally just drawn to like like lightning is is you know firework firecrackers. I guess they're supposed to be bombs, but regardless, we not we have within us like a natural desire to see the lightning show in the sky, and like you know it leads to wonder and all that other stuff. So I've been watching for a long time, but uh, the the coming up from underground um, that phenomenon, uh, I've I've definitely. Uh, looked at like I always look at trees that are struck by lightning and and like question like you know where the where the charring is and all of that sort of stuff that makes <clears throat> I'm not I'm not particularly well versed in it but I've 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 it's been in my mind space before so there's a couple of places now that I want to sort of go with this so when you sent okay. that Danny, it had happened for us earlier this week and then of course I also watched some of David's video yesterday where he was talking about how cool he's always thought lightning was. And then he also mentioned this show that he's been watching called Manifest that I had been wanting to watch, but Laura had been like, no, no, no. But then when David mentioned it along with the lightning yesterday, uh, like I was like, let's watch it. And he had said that like, they, there were some things in this show that sort of were clues as to how time and weather and things like that sort of work. Like, you know, there's, there was some little gives and we started watching and already I'm seeing that, right? So we watched two episodes last night. Um, and this show manifest all it's about people who get on a plane and they experience weather events on, while they're on the plane, right? And when they land, five years has passed and they, everyone had already thought they were dead, but for them, it had just been two days, like a day, you know, overnight or whatever, the flight time. Okay, and it was a flight that had been delayed, that they, these people had stayed behind and not gotten on their original flight because it was overbooked, right? So half their family went forward without them and half, they stayed there and it created this very interesting time gap, right? So it's, an, it's interesting to look at. So there was enough stuff around that stuff. And then you sent me that. I'm like, okay, she's already playing with us because she's falling in line to, you know, where I was wanting to maybe go with some things already today. So there's a couple of things like that have been going on and swirling around <clears throat> sort of in my paying attention consciousness for the last couple of weeks. And you already walked into another of them, two of them, Michael, with your questions about, um, uh, if we're at the center of some battle between different factions doing weather manipulation, right? Like, what does that look like? Um, and then also what you said about, about rainbows, okay? And, about, and what, what, what the girls said. So the first thing is like years ago, I uh, interviewed multiple times a gentleman named Sean Gatro, who has a very interesting YouTube channel that's not updated anymore, but it's called Industrial Surrealism. And he did the work on what he called at that time, cloud cloaked craft. Right. And he got in. I mean, he started like, you know, he was he fell upon it accidentally. He's a photographer who likes to photograph the sky and he'd noticed some anomalous stuff. And he ended up catching something on his camera that led him down a rabbit hole that really like exposed something very interesting, but also took a heavy toll on him. And he ended up having to look into all kinds of technologies, spirituality, mythic books, all kinds of things, and still doesn't really know for sure what it is. But what did he capture? Or like, what did it look like? So what it was, was he discovered that there was structures inside of the clouds and he began to recognize the same geometry of structures inside these clouds over and over and over again, right? And while he was able to line them up to some sort of like, sort of on the quiet or secretive possible military, you know, vessels and things like that, 
They also seemed to match things that were reported in, you know, ancient mythological and religious texts about the creatures of the oceans above and things like this, right? Like it, there seems to be um, like an earthly man technology explanation for things and also like a, an entity mythic, you know, spiritual kind of explanation. And, and it's hard to know. There's a synchromistic aspect to, to it that as there always is when something is has a truth, right? Um, and I'm one, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but did you coin that phrase, synchromistic? No, synchromysticism, like it's kind of like, so it's sort of a lot of what we're doing when we play the glass bead game, or if you follow like um, Chris Knowles, or even to a certain extent, Goro Adachi, or some of these people, it's kind of like, you know, like syncretizing things, we facts with like mythic ideas or spiritual ideas in a way that brings more complexity and sense to them, right? Got it. Okay, um, but I wish I had come up with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so one of the things, he's, he noticed a lot of things, right, as he videotaped, and you can still see most of this on his YouTube channel, that the craft seemed to be made up of other pieces that were the smaller versions of the same as the larger craft. So the idea of fractalization, right, that the big thing is made up of the same pieces of the small thing. The small thing is, right, that kind of thing. But he also noticed that these, some of these crafts seemed to be attractive, attractive. So he considered this something different than regular chemtrails. There'd be a craft and there seemed to be like some sort of exhaust system that would create what looked like a cloud around it to cloak the fact that there was a craft. But there would also be regular chemtrails in the sky. And he seemed to notice that these things seemed to like go along sometimes and like vacuum them up. Right, and he didn't know if these things were trying to clean the, the atmosphere or if they were using whatever was in the chemtrail as food or gas or whatever, right? And that like these smaller pieces that were on the larger craft would like jump off of it, go around, do some task, and then like return to the big craft and dock back on kind of stuff, right? It seemed to be like a self-intelligent, self-organizing thing that like knew exactly what it was doing and worked equally like technology as like watching like a, you know, a school of fish or a herd of animals or something like that, right? And, you know, he got into all, looking at all kinds of stuff. And you can listen when you hear him on his videos, right? He is fucking mystified by this. He is not trying to push an idea or one interpretation of what's going on. He's like, what on earth is going on? Like he was not particularly necessarily, you know, he has an interesting background, but his bent isn't quite the same as yours or mine, Michael, in terms of like our like where we turn first to, to try and find the answer or whatever. Where, right? where did he go? Well, he he was puzzled at first, and eventually it led him to the places that you and I would go first. Right? He was he was just trying to like make he really went to like making sense of it like on a geometric and like a technological level first. And then he went looking and, and he started at like military and then got deeper and deeper into conspiratorial and then mistake or spiritual or whatever kinds of things, right? He didn't, he didn't like jump right to like, just have a stock, have a plan. <laughs> like he didn't, he didn't do what you and I kind of do, right? So anyway, so I wanted to, that when you're talking, when we're talking about the different faction-y kind of stuff of things going on, right? Like there's earthly and un, un, I don't know what the name is, I'll just call it unearthly, interacting with each other in all of these ways. And we're, it's hard to identify who's got what and what they're actually doing with it. And one person's, you know, treasure is another person's trash, you know? So like literally there's all kinds of, you know, literally they could be laying down poison for the humans, but there's some other entity out there that's like, yeah, this is gas for me. I'll eat it and say, <laughs> right? like who the heck knows what's going on? So there's that. But then you also said rainbows. Okay, and um, we do look a lot at FPV Angel, right? And they just put up a new video last week that was very intriguing to me. It was a short video and they titled it Operation Rainbow Warrior. And they had this amazing animation that they had, you know, he, he's really good with graphics. And he was kind of showing how you can use rainbows to, if you can figure out certain, the location of like where they start and end and use those coordinates, like, you can figure out where the particle accelerators or the angels are because it is the reflect the, the rainbows occur in places where they're reflecting what's going on underground. And according to them, obviously, from their ongoing narrative, that the system or the machine or whatever is inside the earth is like the the 
activation is happening now. It's a 400 year cycle of it being more active and then dormant and whatever. And it's being highly activated right now. And so there's like a lot of rainbows, right? Because the thing it's being used, a lot of sun dogs, a lot of these kinds of things that we look in the sky and go, wow, that's amazing. So they had in this, this video, it was short, I'll, I'll attach it here. Um, they had said that like in certain, like in the middle of these or like, to, you know, with certain coordinates around this, once you figure it out, there's generally like old churches that are like, you know, you're sort of Tartarian or mud flood kind of buildings or state capitals or certain special buildings or, or uh, museums or things like that that are sort of special or kind of central to this location. And I thought, okay, like maybe, but also I would add to this from for our conversation last week, maybe baseball fields, baseball stadiums, and like the weapons companies that are like, you know, like Boeing and Rocketdyne when they're under the ground in some of these locations, that that might be something that is there as well. Um, and it also matches up to all of the talk about over the rainbow and Oz programming and things like that with, my, with, with MKUltra and said things, right? And so this name Operation Rainbow Warrior kind of really appealed to me and this idea that we can like actually use things, we can measure an experience to figure out where these things are, right, and start to understand how that system goes. So there's that. And then I've been made aware, I've heard of these people before. But can I ask you a couple of questions about what you just said about the FTV and the... FTV, yeah. The, um, so how, how does the name Rainbow Warrior tie into that? Like, what's the warrior aspect? So that, that there's something that people that, that that people can do, right? Like that there's something like we are obviously undergoing some kind of change to the place that we live in, right? And and I'm going to get into this when I go to the next part that I'm going to get into with this. But like we're being told that there's a group of people that are doing this to us, right? When really this may be a natural process that some people are aware of and some aren't, but they're using their knowledge of it sort of against us. But that if we gain the same knowledge then we can mm. make decisions for ourselves that are a way of like not fighting back and the like, you know, fighting against them system, but like we can take care of ourselves. Okay. Right? Kind okay. of, we will know what this is and we will, all of the answers will be revealed, but will you know what they mean kind of thing, right? All right. I have a second question is you mentioned that um, you could look at a rainbow and kind of like um, ascertain where, uh, where it's located. Like, what do you mean by that? Like if I were to, if I were to walk outside my, my front door and I see a rainbow and the rainbows are always, the sun is like usually that I've seen, it's usually around six o'clock, seven o'clock at night. So the sun is setting and I'm looking East and I can see like the full rainbow. So then like, how does that fit into what you're describing or, do, or, or, or what are your thoughts as it? Because so I don't I know just, if you know the answer. I just watched the video one time and it was like last week or the week before. And I'm not particularly good at like coordinates and maps in terms of like surveying things. I'm good at looking at it with you and we make up our stories and we do our stuff. Right. Right. But he was basically laying out a technique of how you could sort of triangulate or figure out this based on where you the like where the rainbow was in position to the angle you were looking at it and where the nearest building or church that was like that. Am and I interested in the endpoints? I don't I, I need to go back and watch again. OK, right? OK, because I'm going to because I'm going to try it. I'm going to go see because I like this stuff. I'm really good at the spatially. Uh, the spatial and particularly with like uh, non-material things like a rainbow or seemingly non-material. So I'm uh, uh, that that you've you've piqued my interest with those two things. So they're it. trying to collect people's experiences to figure out where the 144,000 of these would be. They, 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 there's there's information on some of these locations of particle accelerators, but they're knowing that there are more. So if people go out and are able to take photographs or video that match up to certain specs that they have figured out that are like for sure, ah, then they will- uh, so, so it's not so much like, you know, my one individual view of the rainbow, but if a variety of people in, in like a, the, the area which I'm in, and we all kind of are looking at the same rainbow from different angles, the, the accumulation of all of those data points would then would be able to figure out where that rainbow is. Is that kind of what where, you're, you're- Where the angel is, right? So huh. I, think it's, I think it could be just your experience, but it would be, you'd have to go around and figure some things out. And if multiple people had the same one- that All would right, be, all right. Right, but they're collecting these things and with a certain amount of like, data added up one can reasonably say there's an angel or a particle accelerator there all right right so that's kind of what they're embarking on now is trying to figure out where these 144,000 angels are okay okay right. Danny I want to jump in on the rainbow thing while we're on the rainbow thing because 
it was the first thing that popped into my mind when you mentioned seeing more rainbows this year than you had before, Michael. And then Emily, when you tied it into buildings, it all just came together. I went to Telluride this summer. Have you guys been to Telluride? No. So Telluride is teeny tiny and it's basically one main street. Like literally, there are a couple like offshoots, but there's the one main street and you know all the buildings lining the main street and it goes into this mountain range and this beautiful waterfall. When I was in Telluride, I saw the brightest, most saturated rainbow I'd ever seen. It seemed fake. I'm like, I've never seen such a rich rainbow. And I was with two other people who had the same thought. And then what I immediately leapt to was the Masonic temple in Telluride because it's such a small, tiny town, but the sign is really large and prominent on this one street and it's rainbow and disco-y and like, just it's such a rainbow, different rainbow disco y free Masonic sign. Yes. And that's what I was looking for as you were talking, Emily. And then when you tied it into the buildings, I'm like, okay, this is nuts. I've never seen a Masonic sign like this. It looks like it's like, like if an eight year old bedazzled it. It makes that perfect is sense to me. It makes <laughs> perfect sense to me. Right. When you go to think about the, okay, so I have noticed that all of the parties that, that I've ever been to that have, let's just say, a special energy or quality to them. There is always a disco ball and it's always angled so that a, laser, a light is hitting it so that it makes like the square pattern on the floor, right? And some of the squares are just like gray and black or whatever, but sometimes there's a prism that rolls through them. And then think about all the imagery that was generated by like Saturday Night Fever or Staying Alive or what was the show? right? The ground that had like the light up multicolored, basically checkerboard or Masonic floor. And, and like Soul Train. Right. Kind of thing. Right. Like this is there is an overlap between these things. Right. And so to me, that actually makes perfect sense. Right. And so um, there uh, I'm going to just because I know they listen, um, Sandra and FPB, if you would like to come on for an episode of Project Kids or with with, with Michael and I and uh, explain both the, more in detail so people can understand this project that you're working on. And then also, I know Sandra's been doing a lot of work on uh, really understanding the Walter Russell work because like they basically say his machine sort of matches up to the way this inner working structure of the, of the earth is, right? So if they would like to come on and, and have a more in-depth conversation where they explain some of this to us, that would probably be really interesting. Um, so I'm just putting that out there, guys. Thank you, I appreciate your work, um, but yes. Right. And there's been lots of reports of rainbows. I, we've seen a couple of interesting rainbows. Danny, I've, some of the most fabulous rainbows I've ever seen are in Santa Fe. And that's also where I've seen the most amount of double rainbows I've ever seen. Right. right. Which I think is really interesting as well. Right. Well, we're sandwiched by the two labs. <laughs> there, there, but there you go. Right. Like, like that would be like either something like that. Right. That there's two in, in close proximity to each other or that whatever is happening here is so strong that there's almost like a split reality there, kind of like where you live, Michael, where there's like almost like, looks like in some pictures, like looks like there's two houses instead of one, the rainbow may be reflecting in a way that it's like showing us, this is where there's a seam in the universe or a seam in the structure, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now, so I have that. Well, let, can, I, can I ask a question real quick? Yes. So, or, or make a comment. So, so uh, I was just looking at Telluride, seeing if I could find the, uh, the Masonic um, temple. Um, the the rainbow which really kicked off the rainbow um thing for me a couple, like re it's really been over the last three weeks that i that all the or maybe the last month that all the rainbows have just like presented themselves but the first thing that was stated was and it was me and it was my boys and it was jenny and it was her girls we're all watch it we're all looking at it and um everyone agreed they've never seen rainbows that the colors were so strikingly bold yeah. and it was a and we said so it was the the, the first one they kicked it off it was a triple rainbow no one's ever seen i guess really all that matters is mine and jenny's opinion because we've got like more experience to go by uh so neither one of us have ever seen triple rainbow it it the colors were unbelievably vibrant like more vibrant than we recall seeing a rainbow and you could see it from end to end and it's not like we're at a at a really a place where you have like this vast flat vista where you can see a uh, very long wise uh, long way as uh, on all directions. So um, that struck me as is unusual. So hearing that from you, uh, Danny, like there, there, there's kind of something there. So I just want to 
Yeah, and I also want to jump on that and say we could see, I didn't see the far end, but we could see the origin point. Like it was very clear, like right. oh, where it starts, which I had never seen where a rainbow starts before. So my guess would be, and this is just my guess, and I could be wrong, and please correct me if, if I'm wrong, that they would say that it's because the activation of these particle accelerators and the machine in general is stronger. It's more highly activated right now. So you're seeing in stronger definition. Right. That the, makes sense. The frequency it's generating. Right. Um, and then... Uh, uh, the, the brightness of it, the, the rainbows that I've seen in the recent months as well have been like almost like day glow or neon, like, you know, in terms of like the, the brightness and the quality, it, it's the colors that you see like in the mushroom trip kind of experience. And then while you were talking, Michael, I just was hearing Kermit the Frog saying, someday you'll find it, the rainbow connection. And maybe he's talking about the connection between rainbows and said machine or rainbows and masonry or whatnot, because I think uh, the, the Muppets are like super highly Masonic encoded and all of that kind of stuff in the way. That Jim Henson did the whole thing out of University of Maryland, which is like 15 miles from NSA headquarters. It's I mean, like when yeah. you you go and you start looking at I don't know. I don't know Jim Henson's role. Like, you know, I've. I, there was a time I went down that path really, really deeply. Uh, I never felt like I always felt like he was he was a uh, he he was useful to a greater agenda. But undoubtedly, the Muppets fit into something, right? I mean, they were in their own squares on the Muppet Show. They were like in their yeah. own Masonic squares, right? Yeah. Thing and you know, remember like Kermit the Frog singing the Rainbow Connection with Deborah Harry. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's one of the most famous iconic combinations of like the cartoon world and the rock music world or whatever. Right. And she's highly Masonic and her origins and the things that, that, that she symbolizes and whatnot. So um, why are there, so, you know, and think about it. So we have the wizard of Oz song famous about rainbows, right? We have it with the Muppets. Um, and so it's been part of, you know, the idea of the, combination of rainbow imagery and masonry and obviously with the mind control and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, this, I think this is it, right? Like when you can make the connection when you can see it end to end and it's bright and clear and obvious, that's how you know something is happening. Mm -hmm. So the other thing is there's been a lot of spikes in the Schumann resonance, like really high recently. So my guess would be that that might correlate to when one of these things goes live or is activated at a frequency level that is beyond a certain point that there's a spike and then it settles down. One of the big spikes was the Simone Biles morning, right? There was a day, like a week and a half ago that like, I felt so fucking weird. Like I could, I, I was scared to be by myself. Like I just felt like this crazy feeling. I can't explain it. I would, like, Laura, I made her, like it passed after an hour or two, right? But I was like, I don't wanna be by myself. There was a, it was right at the time that there was one of these huge spikes outside of the, the facility that I've detailed for so long in Chatsworth, the literal street right on the outside of it is Schumann spelled exactly like the Schumann residence. Like to me, that's, that's clue there, right? Okay, so all that's been happening. And then the other thing that's been coming across my field over and over the last few weeks is this thing going on with this couple. They're known as Mia's new pair of glasses. Are you familiar with this, Michael, at all? Okay. So I've been aware of, of Mia's new pair of glasses for a couple of years, like the, the name would be dropped or whatever. And then, so I guess she started off on her own and there was a guy named, I think, David Lambert or Brian Lambert or something like that. He was working on his own. Then they got together, they became a couple and they started doing all this stuff. And at a certain point, they moved almost all of their uh, stuff off of publicly available formats and you had to like join their thing and they would only have short periods of time where you could join and then they'd shut it down and they'd open it again and whatnot. So most of their content is not available publicly, though there is still a little bit of stuff on YouTube, right? And their whole narrative was really like they're they have pushing this idea of there being what they called an EMPCO, which is an electromagnetic plasma changeover event, right? And that we, we're living through it right now. And um, they would describe the evidence of this and what they thought was going to happen and what you had to do to protect yourself or you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. Can, uh, uh, can you say more slowly what they're saying is happening? What, what is their take? Electromagnetic plasma changeover event. And that's what's happening right now, or they're preparing for it or, or 
but like it's it's, oh, it's an ongoing okay. thing it's not like a necessarily a sudden event okay. although there's asked like when something like when the final thing happens i think like that would match what people might call like ascension like they mm -hmm. say that like mm -hmm. when you see the paintings of people like floating off towards the sun but they have like a rope around them trying to tie pull them back to the earth or whatever like yeah, that see a lot of those paintings that kind of stuff right or whatever i, I okay so anyway, so is the changeover they're referencing mass awakening? No, the change. Well, the changeover there, there. I think it's what we would all like in, call in different ways a reset, right? Mm -hmm. So the, okay. the, the yeah the reset of like laws there's something of nature. Big happening. So like the like so like the, the best way, I, the most holistic way I can explain it to you that I understand that like the, is the FPV angel idea, which is that like all of these things, these particle accelerators, machines inside the Earth they're part of the earth. It's not something that like Boeing is building. It's something that Boeing is trying to understand, but they tell us they build it, right? Mm -hmm. And that every 400 years, there's like a system reset where the machine sort of activates and readjusts kind of everything and then resettles. And this is where there's a lot of like floods and, and lot mass die off and things like that. But some people, because this has happened so many times over history, have sort of figured out the timing on the cycle how best to manage it so you stand the best chance to sort of survive. And then those people are creating the information and ending up in control on the other side of it, but that there's a way to live in harmony with this motion or with this, this machine or these particle accelerators so that you stand the best chance of survival, right? And it has to do with being in harmony with nature. This, this is part of nature. It's not opposed to nature, but that there are people out there that would prefer us believing that they yield these weapons, they're doing it to us, they're in control, when really they just know a little bit more about it than we do. And whenever you're coming to the end of the cycle and the changeover is about to happen, all this crazy shit starts to be revealed because you can't hide it anymore. The rainbows are this to that or whatever. Right. And at that time, the people, the managers will create the most amount of political chaos, right? To distract people from understanding what is happening kind of thing. So they're, you know, they may say, though, we can't tell people because they'd freak out, but it also offers them the benefit of being able to be in control more on the other side. And so they'll even create something else called a great reset so that people think that's what the reset is instead of that it's actually the natural system resetting itself and some things will survive it and some won't and this is how you this is how you try and holistically work through that period of time but that's the best i can do to sort of explain it now no that makes perfect sense i mean that. i'd say that's what we're all doing yeah like so, and like the more you hear or at least for me the more the more you see people who kind of have a, a, a similar sense, but then they come about it from their different perspectives, like bringing in, like whether it's the FTV angels or whether it's the Mia's new pair of glasses, or even the guy who's starting to look at the, you know, what he's capturing in the cloud devices. Like when we, we kind of like, and what we're doing, like we're all kind of, it's the, the old analogy of being in a, a dark room and everyone's touching an elephant trying to describe what it is. So like the more pieces which we can hear and the more perspectives I find very, very um, helpful to this process. Yeah. Okay. So a couple of other things. So these me and new pair of glasses folks. So I looked into them a couple of times, but I get easily turned off by people when like their narrative is that anybody who doesn't tell you what they're telling you is a shill or lying to you or whatever, like it's more, right? Like that was a main part of like their videos and what they were saying is that so-and-so is lying to you, right? It, it just, to me, like when you're more anti something than you are explaining what you're for, it's for, so I never dug really into them. That doesn't mean they're not right about some things, right? Mm -hmm. And so like this, you know, I, I guess they've been missing for a while and the story is now that they're dead that these two are dead. Now, their sort of way that they describe things sounds much scarier and much more apocalyptic than the way FPV Angel does. Like, I feel like FPV Angel, but again, I'm much more familiar with FPV Angel than I am with the Mia's new pair of glasses. I think that there's like, I, I think that they're describing the same thing, but they're, they have a different sort of solution or a different, like maybe like what you'd consider like the holistic or the natural sense versus like the biblical sense of like how to deal with it or what it means like a lot of the stuff from the Mia's new pair of glasses sounds very apocalyptic and very like you know what you hear from religious people who think rapture is coming kind of stuff but they do get into like how this plasma event creates like a 
merging or a penetration of what were separate stacked realities or dimensions before and there's all this craziness and chaos that ensues so this even kind of ties back to what we did with Masaki right but now apparently these two are dead that one of them died of an overdose and one of them died of, of suicide I don't know for sure because I didn't follow these people closely but they were missing for a long time and there seems to be this piece of information out there now Right, and so that the piece has, of information being that they died, or they discovered like that they're that that they, that they're dead. Then that, that they're, they're dead. Body. And how old were these people? Like in their thirties. They were in their thirties. Were young. they good? Like in terms of like the quality of what they produce, like you know, in all senses of the word, good. Like were they competent? All right. So you and I have like a you know a listener, a follower, like in common that we both like very much, who has spent much more time looking into this than than, than I have. And she would say, like, she thinks that they're right about a lot of things. And then they do the same things that bother me, right? But that, yes, like there is it for, and that, you know, that they're gotcha. are kind of crazy, but that doesn't mean that they're not right on all of stuff. Have you ever looked in the mirror? <laughs> <laughs> right? So I, I think, right, exactly, right? So at this point, you know, so I did look at some of Mia's older videos. And she was showing some things that look similar in phenomenon to what the lightning I was seeing. And the, right, you're, right. you're talking, what you were showing us, Danny. And, and then what's, you know, Young Lady at Conspiracy Cocktail was talking about. And then, you know, and then it takes us to the fires, right? That these fires right now, um, you know, Sonia had had somebody on last summer who was talking about some of these fires really being related to like micro black holes, right? And, um, and then something that happened with this recent fire in Utah that sort of matches up to this profile that, that, that we're talking about, right? So <clears throat> one of our listeners and a friend uh, was in the area that, like, that was supposed to evacuate, right? And the supposed fire, you're going to love this, Michael, was started by sparks from a catalytic converter explosion or something like that. Okay, so Danny, if you don't know, a couple, several weeks back, my catalytic converter was stolen, which led to some research into that this is the hot new crime because there's radium, rhodium, rhodium in these catalytic converters that, that thieves can sell for $200 a gram. So who's collecting all this rhodium? And Michael and I went to this place of like, maybe somebody's building time travel devices or dimension piercing devices, right? In fact, somebody sent me um, a video from TikTok of like a homeless gentleman, right? And, and homeless people play into our narrative as well of, of, of time travelers, drawing on the side of the, of the bank that he lives in front of like the device or the geometry of like the, what he needs to create to get to travel back to wherever he's from, right? And then I'm like, oh, okay, this is interesting. Like what if these are the guys looking for rhodium or whatever to power their device or to open holes or whatnot, right? But, um, you know, if, 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 if the game afoot is, there's two possibilities as I see it, right? Someone has figured out that you can create these explosions or something that tear holes in the fabric of space and time and that you can use this to move between times or dimensions or something like that, right? And that's the game afoot with the things being stolen, right? And then if you, uh, there'll be left, if the idea I think is to create yourself a little black hole but not have a fire happen. But if one does happen, people will think it's just from sparks from a catalytic converter from a car and there seems to be a reasonable explanation. The other option is that it's this plasma thing coming from underground, right? And it has somehow also the same sort of chemical signature, right? And so having this sort of uh, wave of catalytic converter crime that creates radi that involves rhodium offers certain explanations for why fires are starting, right? That don't tell the real sort of story because if people knew the real story, either A, they'd freak out or B, more likely like the, the way that this is being managed by the people who like to think of themselves as, you know, the chosen ones or whatever, the jig would be up. Right. So like those are kind of my take. I feel like all of these things we've talked about today are sort of connected. And it's just like arranging the information into the proper sort of setup or order or whatever. And we'll be able to see like how how the system works. Right. So I think that there's like a lot of FPV there. You know, like maybe somebody maybe there's somebody in, in our audience or or your audience that is really familiar with the Mia's new pair of glasses narrative and they can fill us in on better details 
um, so that I can fully understand it or we can understand it together. And then there's these natural phenomenons going on. And there's the question of whether we need to reframe what our understanding of nature is. And that nature possibly includes machines and electrical technology that is not what we think of like Samsung makes or whatever, right? That, that shit's all modeled after this natural thing and that we need to have some adjustment in how we classify these things. And, um, and, and then we can better understand what's right in our face. Because I don't think there's actually any secrets. I think it's all right here. And it's just the way that we perceive or understand it. So there we go, guys. Danny, do you have anything to say? I saw that you were searching for something or it looked like that. No. All right. All right. Are we, uh, are we good with this? Are we ready to move on or do we want to stay here for a little bit longer? Was there any more, like, I just am asking, like, you being there on the land and having that experience that night, right? Just last night, Danny, right? And not being front loaded with all of this information that I'm aware of. Does that feel right to you? Does that sort of like answer, like feel like that's more of the right, that, that does that resonate at the level of like, yes, what I saw last night might fit into that kind of narrative. Yeah, the plasma coming from the ground totally resonates. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as you texted me that, I was like, oh yes, of course, that's what it is. Um, I mean, everything's so surreal these days. Every day is an onslaught of weirdness. So sometimes it's challenging to parse out is it metaphysical? Is it psychological? Is it spirit? You know, like who, who knows? I didn't have any weird feelings surrounding it. Um, that makes the most sense. So the last thing I wanted to say, just to close the loop on the David Martin aspect in this TV show manifest, right? Without, I'm only two shows in, so I can't say for sure, for sure I know what's happening, but they experienced some kind of weather event. Did they say lightning? I know there was turbulence that were not showing up on the radar, right? They had no idea the turbulence were coming. There was like a violent shaking of the airplane, right? Like violent, like people's drinks fell and computers hit stuff and cracked and whatever, but they were okay and they were able to land. Right. And, um, you know, when they landed, only two days had passed for them, but five years had passed for the people on the ground. And they had been coming from Jamaica to New York. So I guess there's the implication you could pass over Bermuda Triangle or, or whatever. Right. But that whatever happened, that there was some sort of violent, energetic, electrical kind of event where they seemed to like go into some other reality right, for what seemed like five years to everybody on the ground, but was just a very short period of time for them because they all landed not aged at all, right? Like, so now everyone in their life is five years older and they're at the age that they were when they took off, right? But that, you know, this idea that how, how weather and flight and navigation are connected to time and how time doesn't operate in the same way on every level, right? Like, I think that was kind of what when David mentioned it, he was sort of steering us towards looking at, right? Because my guess would be he is on some level, I'm sure he looks at different stuff, very well aware of some of this phenomenon and how it is used um, to spin a narrative that is not accurate, but that can, most people would think, okay, well, that makes sense and blah, 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 right? So. Okay, one, one more thing that is coming to mind, <clears throat> I'm just recalling your most recent show with Bobby P, mm -hmm. um, where you guys talk about the navigation issues mm -hmm. that are going on. And I don't know if you guys heard that last week, there's some man, and I'm blanking on his name, but he's, he tracks the movements of the tectonic plates and these sort of waves of seismic activity. And there were two days last week where the plates didn't move at all, which he's never seen. Wow. But like complete, total standstill. And, and my thought, knowing none of this, but intuitively was, oh, was that the great reset? Did we just have that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A changeover event, right? Right. And right, there's right, going right. to be lots of activity on both sides of the changeover. So leading up to it and then in the years or whatever, like it's a, it's a long process. Absolutely. I mean, we're seeing, so like not, this is not me saying sports are important and people it's worthy of paying attention to for any sport related reason, but these are the people who are the most have the best air awareness, are the most kinesthetically aware, are the most in touch with the electrical system of their body, right? Whether they think of it that way or not. And all of the top athletes on the planet right now are either not playing or not playing well, right? And my guess would be that the most highly specialized electrical systems 
are having the most trouble right now. Look at how, like, I mean, like, I'm not saying that he's special, but like all of Tesla's plots are failing right now and stuff like that, right? There seems to be all of the, you know, and the things that seem to work pretty well are things that are more analog in nature, right? Okay, two other things just popped into my mind. As I said, yes, let's move on. One is Tesla's laboratory was in Telluride. Ah. Um, okay. Um, number two was I was taught, I had a session with a client yesterday who's recovering from a stroke and she's having issues with her balance and her gait. And she said, this isn't physical. She's like, trust me, I know my body and the issues I'm having around balance. I, she's like, I can't put my finger out. I can't explain what it is, but it's not coming from my body or its inability. It's something else. She's, she's not like an Olympic athlete per se, yeah. um, but she's pointing to some sort of environmental or external something that's affecting her ability to walk straight and balanced. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, so I think that's, uh, I think that's just something that we should pay attention to, right? Like, you know, like it's very, um, it's very telling when you start to like, string all those things together, right? Each individual circumstance is like, okay, that could just be, you know, something random or whatever. But when, when all of the random occurrences seem to indicate uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a basically like a problem with like navigation or temporal, you know, sort of location or geospatial or kinetic awareness or whatever, when they all seem to, I mean, and I think that even some of the quote unquote side effects of the poke of the bite, like seem to match up to some level of like fog or disorientation or the electrical systems. Like, and if you think of like the veins and ports and arteries in the body working just like wi electrical wiring, right? That they seem to be having some of the same issues. Um, and that, that, you know, that, that provides uh, one level, I mean, uh, of cover story for why they might be having that when it's really just like our fucking earth is going batshit and they're not talking about that at all. Right. Right. So anyhow. All right. So let's do this. Let's wrap up this first segment. We're going to move over into the patron segment and Michael has something he wanted to move on to. So I'm excited to find uh, what, where we're going next. But before we leave the public segment, Danny, why don't you tell our friends where they can find you? Oh, our friends can find me at dannycats.com. And I do recommend checking out uh, the recording of the live stream that I did over the weekend, the language of sovereign authority, unfuck with the bull empowerment technology for base badasses. It was what was that word you said? Unfuckable? Unfuck with the bull. Unfuck with the bull. <laughs> Very and nice. I love, I, love, I love the draw, drawing of Sadie pat, patting the little, you know, dictator on the head, telling him he was cute. You know, that was, that was a great graphic. I liked it a lot. Thanks. So, so that's available for people to just buy. That's the available for people. They can download the recording now um, and they can find everything at dannycats.com and follow me on Instagram because I post every day. And we've had a couple of weeks off, but I think we'll be back with another episodes of Words likely next week. So you can find us there as well. Michael, anything to say? Uh, to you can find me where you always find me at susquehannaalchemy.com. Uh, and, you know, that's a good place. All right, join us at patreon.com forward slash off planet media or projectkids.locals.com for the rest. We will see you on the other side.